Welcome. This is a continuation of my series on INTJ grieving in this very brutal school of hard knocks I am currently attending. I will put links in the description to the other two videos I have created so far on this topic. I was ready for another talk with Stacy. Session 2. Memories. My date is June 23rd, three weeks and four days after my daddy died. I am returning to visit the Stacy who is still living in the Addis Year 23, but three days after my first visit. Stacy, I'm back, I said. Stacy was sitting once again in her special spot above the Colt Cave, but the wind was blowing and rain was falling on her raincoat. Al, Stacy said, I have been thinking a lot about our talk, and I realize that the sharp question you began our last discussion with has great merit. I had not even begun to work out a path to peace after such a great loss. I was walking in ignorance, just waiting for the hammer to fall. Something like that could happen at any time. My children, my family, all are finite beings. Any of them might die. It was quite egocentric of me to only worry about my own death and how many times have villains in history used the lives of family members as blackmail to control the actions of those who love them. My dying in this context is a small thing in comparison. I have to thank you for bringing up this topic for me to work on. I think that it would be far better to be prepared than to just go into it blindly. I believe that you are right, Stacy, I said. I told the nurse in ICU. Her name was Michelle. I never remember names, but I remember hers. She listened to my painful ramblings, and she treated Dottie the way an angel might have. I told Michelle that I had worked through my own death, and I was not afraid of dying myself, but I had never worked through what I would do, or could do, if Dottie died. It was too horrible of an idea to dwell on. Well, Stacy said, thanks to you, I have now begun to work on this. What I would like to discuss with you today is how memories relate to the present and future. That sounds reasonable, I said. Memories are monsters at times, ripping and tearing at my heart, and then sometimes they are healing agents of joy and peace. When you look back at a memory, Stacy said, or you discuss a shared memory with someone else, you are studying something that at best is entirely in the past and locked away like an insect in amber. But it is also partly, even mostly, lost forever. What do you mean, I ask? How often, Stacy said, has your recollection of an event clashed with details from someone else who shared that same memory with you? Often, I said. People comment on how good my memory is, but it still fails me sometimes. Also, Stacy said, if you come across a Tri-D image of something that you thought you remembered well, you will often notice things your memory got wrong. Sadly, I said, we only have 2D images, but your point is still valid. Pictures are great at pointing out false memories. Details are often changed in my memory. Even when an event has just occurred, Stacy said, if you check several observers' memories of the details, they will disagree, often about very important things that you would think they would get right. That's true, I said. I've seen that happen myself. We don't even see the present very clearly, Stacy said. And this incorrect impression of an event is what is stored into our memory, which, of course, is also an imperfect container for it. It's leaky, corrupting, and even subject to complete loss. Often the only truly significant facts that you can retain are the emotions that the event triggered within you. So I ask, what's your point? What purpose do memories serve? Stacy asked. Memories connect us with a past, our perceived past. However, it is not truly the past. What we actually keep inside our minds are our own imperfect impressions of events that we created as we experienced life. These impressions were also processed by our personal filters, and only then were they stored into our imperfect memories. Okay, I said, our memories are not perfect, but they're still better than nothing. Our understanding, Stacy said, of our own personal history is incomplete, distorted, and to some degree it has been modified to fit into our worldview, along with the norms of our culture, our philosophical or religious beliefs, as well as the way our family and friends view what is correct or incorrect behavior. 
If something doesn't fit, we tend to bend it and shape it until it does fit, or we toss it out. Sounds pretty primitive when you describe it that way, I said. I have struggled with many things that society has embraced, but I reject personally. It has caused me to diverge, in some cases drastically, from what the masses accept as true. A dangerous view, Stacy said. Anyone who disregards public opinion in favor of his own opinion will appear odd or even evil. There have been many people who have died for their inconvenient view on how things should be. That has told me many stories about the tyranny and executions that the government used to keep dissenters quiet. The century you described sounds brutal, I said. So were many centuries when it comes right down to it, Stacy said unhappily. Perhaps all of them. But let me continue. We are each carrying with us a flawed view of our own personal history. Sadly, but necessarily, world history is far worse. I am fortunate to have a very large collection of digital versions of Earth books, and I have read a good many of them. I have found that history books are written with a bias. Always. No matter how altruistic a historian may be, no matter how hard he may try to keep his personal biases out, he will fail. And some of them didn't try very hard at all. Sometimes governments made honest reporting of facts punishable by death or by other forms of maltreatment. It's amazing we know anything at all, really, I said. Most history was written by winners of wars, and therefore the losers are always portrayed as horrible villains who did nothing but evil, and the winners are wonderful, noble people who fought for a just cause. Yeah, Stacy said in disgust. But moving on, even if a historian were completely honest and omniscient, he would not have time or space to include everything that happened. Billions of people were living lives and doing things over thousands of years. I have often wondered, I said, what the day of a guy like myself would have been like living with my family in one of the cities that were built thousands of years ago, but today are unknown and completely covered by sand. People who lived lives that were meaningful to them and who worked hard and enjoyed life are now completely unknown to us. They laughed, they cried, they lived, and they died, and now no one cares at all. That is the fate of us all, Stacy said. In the end, even mankind will cease to be mankind and will evolve into something else that is not mankind. They will have us to look back on as less advanced ancestors who were cute and interesting, but they will be so glad they are not like humans, those primitive animals. Individually and collectively, we will reach an end. Each generation is replaced by the next, and so it has ever been. What a happy place to live, I said. Isn't it, though, Stacy said. As for history, even documenting the events of one hour on planet Earth in the 23rd century, when Mom and Dad were born, would be impossible. There were 15 billion people alive, and that incredible number was attained even after the destructive eruption of the Yellowstone volcano had wiped out over 2 billion people, and the entire planet had to rebuild much of its civilization. But think of how many distinct events would occur in just one hour, even one of the short Earth hours, with so many people living their lives at once. I imagine that is hard for you to picture living on Addis, I said. Yes, Stacy said. We only have 30 people on Addis, all here in the Colt Valley, and two of them are androids. Trying to picture 15 billion people all living on the same planet at the same time is beyond me, really. Nonetheless, I said, your point is valid. There was too much going on at the same time at any point during humanity's existence on planet Earth for anyone to make a detailed record of it. However, historians didn't try to document just one hour, Stacy said. They wrote books that covered years, decades, centuries, and even millennia. Simply choosing what to write about and what to leave out showed a historian's bias. Each historian always had his own opinion, and it was clearly displayed in how he portrayed practices, ideals, and actions of leaders, and even entire societies. In other words, by necessity, all histories are incomplete and distorted, even ones that held to high academic standards. Most of human history, I said, the actual events that transpired, is unknown and unknowable to us today. 
You are absolutely correct on that point. But our ignorance goes much farther than that, Stacy said. In a sense, we are utterly ignorant. As we have discussed, we don't accurately know our personal history or the history of mankind. We don't even know where we are, really. We are moving so fast that anything you know now will be obsolete in the next second. Addis spins around once a day on its axis. It orbits Lug once a year. Lug goes around the center of the Colt Galaxy every 50,000 years or so. And the Colt Galaxy is flying away from all the other galaxies at a tremendous speed. Asking the question, where am I, is for all intents and purposes, meaningless. The more we know about the universe, I said, the more we realize that we don't yet know. We are fighting to learn more, and we do learn more, but it only creates more questions. And where are we going? Stacy asked. Dad is building a large spaceport south of the Colt Valley, and has already built a space station in orbit around Addis, and it will be a launching point to begin colonizing the galaxy once our population grows large enough to support immigration. Lug will last maybe five billion more years, so there's no rush. Your dad is a busy man, I said. You have no idea, Stacy said. He is always coming up with cool ideas and doing things to make all of our lives better. I bet he's proud of you, I said. That's what he tells me, Stacy said in embarrassment. But the point I was getting to is that this seems like no answer to our question of where we are going. Mom and Dad are androids. They are effectively immortal. Who knows? Maybe I'll go that route when I get old. But even that is not an answer. Living 70 years, 700 years, 7,000 years, or even 70 or 700,000 years will be the very same thing for you once you are dead. If you do not exist, I said, and you do not know that you do not exist, which seems unavoidable, whatever came before will not matter to you at all. In the end, all roads lead to death, Stacy said. Last time, we discussed the fact that life is not fair, even when everyone is treated just the same. This is an example of that, because those who are tyrants and those who are oppressed, those who do horrible things to people, including torture and murder, along with those who are the victims, and those who are rich or poor, those who die as gluttons or by starvation, are all in the end in the exact same state of non-existence. The murderer lies in the same ground as the murdered, even if the crime goes unsolved or unpunished. In time, we all share the same fate. Now there's a happy thought, I said. The fact that it's true doesn't make it any less sobering. And so now my train of thought reaches its aim, Stacy said. What you have to face, Al, is the fact that your personal history has suffered a complete breakdown. Your past 45 years no longer point to your tomorrow. They do not give you guidance for today. They point to a future that will not and cannot ever exist. Your unenviable task is to create a future that is cut free from your past. It is, in a way, like waking up with a form of amnesia, where instead of having no memory, you have what amounts to a false memory, a memory that gives you misleading directions about how you should proceed. Your day can no longer center around Dottie. Your life can no longer center around her. Those memories, however precious they are to you, point to a road that has now been washed out, and it leads nowhere. And I thought your last idea was sobering, I said. This is far harder to swallow, but alas, just as true, I fear. While you must build your life without the main path of your history to guide you, Stacy said, there is a part of your history that might help. Look through your past and seek things that you did apart from Dottie. Things that either stood entirely on their own, or that stood almost on their own, with the only connection to Dottie being that you shared them with her after the fact. That is like trying to get a large wad of gum out of your hair, I said. I spent a lot of time alone, even when Dottie was in the house. Most of my time, really. But mixed in with that, due to Dottie's uneven sleeping schedule, I was always checking on her to make sure she was okay. When she was awake, I would go out and check to see if I could do something for her. We shared things, and she was never far out of my mind, even when I was all alone in my office. But I have to admit that a lot of what I did 
did not really interest Dottie. She didn't care for math or philosophy all that much. There was a large area of my activities that could stand more or less alone. I am not sure if I can pull them apart from Dottie completely, though. Maybe. It's too early to say for sure. This is just a rough map, Al, Stacy said. It is drawn by hand with a crayon. I know that. But it is a starting point. It is a starting point, I said. And I will work on your suggestion. Thank you for sharing your ideas. And I will come back for more of them, if you wouldn't mind. It's a shame that you couldn't enjoy my weather today, Stacy said. I love the rain. Sunrise Bay is being whipped by the wind. White caps are topping all of the waves. It's beautiful. I wish I could be there to enjoy it with you too, I said. I'm glad you are enjoying it, though. I'll see you next time. Bye, Al. I cut the connection. This is the second part of a series of internal discussions with Stacy Colt Kurtzen on the planet of Addis. I am working through my grieving process to try and reach a state of peace, with a purpose to living my life. I have chosen this method because it feels right to me. If you wish, you are welcome to join me in this journey to peace.